All right, guys, welcome to our first ever broadcast. This is just going to be a space where we can talk uh, some good sports conversation. Right now we just wrapped Game 3 of the NBA Finals with the Spurs <coughs> taking down the Miami Heat. Um, we have a lot to talk about there, but first we are joined by special guest today. Um, this is Alex. Alex, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I write a blog, Tempo Free Soccer. As you can imagine, listening to it is kind of a mix of uh, basketball analytics, uh, these advances we've made, both basketball and football and baseball analytics, and trying to bring it to soccer. So I've been working on that for the past couple of years. I write for a variety of different sources online, um, just trying to look at the game in an analytic, analytical manner. So it's kind of what I do for fun. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, well, thanks for being with us tonight. Um, with the World Cup right around the corner, we're uh, going to be starting here on Thursday. We thought it would be a good chance for Alex to come in and kind of give us a little bit of a guide for what we should be watching for. First off, we want to talk teams. Tell us what we need to know about teams in this year's World Cup. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think in terms of favorites, everyone's looking at Brazil. Um, Nate Silver, who uh, you know is famous for predicting presidential elections, He's come out and said Brazil are large favorites. Uh, if you look at uh, you, all of the uh, uh, other you know sites though, and like I think like the betting markets, I think they're a little bit more bearish on Brazil. Um, Brazil has a good team, but they aren't uh, Brazil of old. They don't play beautiful flowing soccer. They're more of a defensive minded team. Um, so while I do think Brazil is probably the favorites. Um, I think it's more likely than not that they won't win the World Cup, if that makes sense. So I would say other teams that are good. Um, Spain is the best team in the world. If you're just looking 1 through 11, they have the best players in the world. I think there's just maybe a sense that they've almost won too much. Are they bored? How much do you know? Do they really, honestly, you know, do they have enough? They, a lot of the players just play for Real Madrid or Barcelona in these long club seasons. You know, they won Euro, they won the last World Cup, they won the Euro before that. How many, you know, top international competitions do they really have in them? Um, so I think really if Spain... Yeah, sorry, what's that? I said it's a good problem to have. Yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. I think honestly that they're being underrated because, you know, they're so... It's almost like a boring storyline at this point for the media so that they almost aren't getting as much attention as they probably deserve. Um, I think the other favorites... After them, I think those are easily the two best teams. After that, I think there's a drop-off. And I think Argentina has to be talked about because while they've underperformed in previous World Cups, uh, I think they probably have the best attack in the world. And when you talk about Messi, who's a top two player in the world, uh, Di Maria, Angel Di Maria on the wing, who was the best player on the field in the Champions League final um, and almost single-handedly won it for Real Madrid. Um, and then you also have Sergio Aguero, who's probably a top five to ten forward in the world as well. I think they're going to score a lot of goals. I think they got an easy draw in terms of the group. They got one of the easiest groups, so they should progress easily through the early stages. Um, the one problem with them is their defense. There's a lot of question marks there, um, both defense and some midfield questions. So it might be one of those things where they score a lot, but they may give up a lot of goals as well. So uh, I do think that they have to be considered a favorite. And then after them, a lot of people are pretty high on Germany, but um, I get the I sense that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, every, every, every competition, you know, they'll probably, you know, they make it to the semis. You know, they've been third place in, uh, you know, the last couple World Cups, basically. So they get close, but they haven't been able to take that final step. I think people think maybe this is the chance for them, but... They've been riddled with injuries recently, and I, I'd have to say, in my opinion, I really don't see them winning the World Cup. You know, I, you know, I think they'll progress, but I just don't think they have enough quality. Um, when they named their squad, interestingly, they only named one forward, uh, Miroslav Klose. It's kind of indicative of the changing style of soccer now, where a lot of teams are now playing with a lot of attacking midfielders, throwing them forward but they don't have as many in the modern game. There's not this idea of, like, the target striker. I think that's kind of interesting. So maybe that will work out well for them. Um, but I tend to think that uh, they may just have too many injuries right now. They just lost Marco Royce for the World Cup, and he is one of their top uh, attacking midfielders. So we'll see how they'll recover. I'm sure they'll do fine. Um, and then in terms of other teams, 
Uh, everyone's favorite dark horse is Belgium. Um, they have a great team, a lot of great players, but not a lot is known about them in international competitions. They haven't. They don't really have much of a footballing history, so uh, there's still a lot of questions around them. But obviously, they have the players to do it. Um, I think at this point, though, if I called them a dark horse, people would probably stab me because so many other people have called them a dark horse. It's just not. I, at some point, they're like the fifth favorite team to win the World Cup. That's not really a dark horse. I think they're definitely a favorite. So, actually, I think a real dark horse would be Italy, which is the other team, maybe in some ways like Germany, that always seems to show up for tournaments, kind of no matter what you think, you know, the quality of the players are. Um, they have Pirlo in the middle, who's kind of like the most interesting man in the world. His family <laughs> owns a vineyard. That's his family business. If he wasn't a soccer player, he'd be bottling wine in Italy. He's Sounds been like an Italian. <laughs> no, he's totally, he's a true Italian. He's got the flowing locks. He's got a beard. He's like a true, like, uh, you know, he's the artist of the game. And he's even said, he's got interesting quotes. He said that he's played more PlayStation video games than actual video games. <laughs> it helps him visualize, it helps him visualize his performance. But he'll only play with Barcelona, and he said he was in tears when he almost got transferred to Barcelona, but the chairman of his club stepped in and said he wasn't for sale because he wanted to play for the team that he played with in his video games so much. So <laughs> oh quite a character, um, but they're a really good team. And uh, interestingly enough, they're favored at less odds than England to win the World Cup, which I find kind of crazy. But I think that they have a really ch good chance to progress far. Um, in terms of players, um, everyone knows about Messi and Ronaldo. Those are the two best players in the world right now. You could put them in any order that you want. Um, Messi is in an interesting situation where even though he's scored literally hundreds of goals in the top competitions of the world and broke all sorts of records, he hasn't uh, achieved much team success. Even at Barcelona, which is one of the best teams of the last 10 to 15 years, probably didn't show up and win as many titles as they could have. And then in particular, Argentina, he hasn't won much with them. And there's a sense, because he actually moved to uh, Barcelona when he was 13 years old to train with uh, the team over there, that he's not almost a real Argentine. And especially when you mix that with the fact that he Argentina hasn't done as well as the fans would hope, and he's actually not as well thought of in Argentina as you might think. I think a lot of people are pretty critical of him. And it, uh, at this point, maybe the only thing he could do to cement his legacy is to win a World Cup. So it's like, no pressure, Messi. You just have to win a World Cup. <laughs> Otherwise, we, you'll never be like the best in our minds. So that's one player to watch. Uh, a lot of pressure on him. Obviously, Cristiano Ronaldo, another situation where he probably is playing the best soccer right now in the world. And we'll see him when he plays against the U.S. Um, but with him... Uh, he, I don't think he's surrounded by enough quality to make it that far. But at the same time, uh, to even make it into the World Cup, Portugal had to play Sweden in a knockout game uh, against Vladimir Ibrahimovic, who might be the third best player in the world. And it was a crazy game, won 3-2 to two by Portugal, where Ronaldo scored three goals and Ibrahimovic scored two goals. Oh, so it's just kind of a sign of what Ronaldo can do when he's on. He can single-handedly win games. So, uh, you know, he just worked through an injury, but today was, I believe, his first day, or he played in a game today and looked good against Ireland in the friendly, so I think all expectations are that he'll be 100% ready to go. Um, I think another team worth watching is actually England. So there's a, if you ever, you know, there's kind of like, a, trying to think what the word is, but the British fans are pretty, uh, they're always like a, very sarcastic about their team's chances. They kind of take they kind of take an attitude of you know we'll just lose on penalties to Germany again. Yeah, like but the truth is they actually have uh, some good young talent. They have uh, the most players under 22, I believe, in the, of any team in the World Cup. I think they're fielding five players under 22 years of age, and so they're kind of throwing out the old guard, um, the Lampards, the um, you know some of these older players, and they're moving forward with these young players. A lot of them like Raheem Sterling, um, young, good winger, Daniel Sturridge, who might have actually, everyone knows about Wayne Rooney, but Daniel Sturridge has scored a ton of goals for Liverpool this year, 
and may actually start ahead of Wayne Rooney in the World Cup. And he's a young player worth watching. So uh, they are in a tough group, and that group's going to be worth watching, which is England, Uruguay, and Italy, and then uh, Costa Rica, uh, who probably will not make it out of the group. But <laughs> one of those three is going to have to go home, Uruguay, England, or Italy. And so that will be a group worth watching. Um, in terms of the United States' chances, I think uh, I think it's going to be tough. I think it comes down to one game. I think it comes down to the first game, really, realistically, um, when they play against Ghana. And, in fact, uh, the coach, Jurgen Klinsmann, has said as much. He, in fact, has gone so far as to, when the team left to go to Brazil, Klinsmann stayed behind in Miami to watch Ghana play a friendly so it just kind of shows the coach is willing to leave his team when they first got to Brazil just to get some extra scouting in on Ghana. And uh, uh, the entire preparations that the United States have taken down to what formation they have employed has kind of been in preparation to play against a team like Ghana. Um, the, they've shifted around some different formations. They've tried a 4-4-2 diamond formation. Um, I think you might see a variation on that. Uh, in the first game against Ghana. Um, I think the most important player for them is going to be Michael Bradley, who is definitely by far their best player at this point. Could probably play for most clubs in the world. I think uh, he had a transfer to Arsenal that didn't quite go through this last summer, and uh, he alluded to the fact that maybe if he was uh, Argentinian, you know, something like that would have happened for him. But instead he took the big money and came home to MLS, but he ha his game hasn't gone down at all. He, if anything, he's gotten better, I believe, in the last year or two. Um, obviously, they need Josie Altidore to score goals. Um, he didn't score very many for uh, 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 Sunderland, but he had two against Nigeria. And he seems to play better for the U.S. than he does for his club teams, which I think is important. Um, yeah. yeah. That yeah. was a good time. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... I think on defense, there's going to be some worries. I think they aren't really tested. Um, one bright spot of the friendlies is anyone who watched the friendlies could attest. Uh, Fabian Johnson played really well. Fabian Johnson might even be among the top three or four players right now. He's going to start it right back. He scored probably one of the best goals I've seen from a U.S. player against Turkey where he made a run all the way from you know midfield, picked up, a ball, played it to Bradley, made a run into the box, and then one time hit a volley into the corner of the net um, that you just don't see from many U.S. players. And part of it is because he's not really American in, in like the sense that he grew up in the U.S. He, he is trained in Germany. And uh, that's going to be a theme on the team. So that will be worth watching. I think, honestly, if I be honest, I don't think the U.S. is going to make it out of the group. But, um, Dang it. Dang it. But, <laughs> but... You heard it here first, guys. I don't think it's going to happen. But I think if we could get uh, you know, one good performance in, maybe get a result against Portugal or Germany, just get a couple goals, in a way that's just as much success because it's showing that we're able to compete. I think that's maybe more important necessarily than making it through is being competitive with the best teams. Because this is the first World Cup in a while where I think most of the U.S. will be watching, and it will be during prime time. Yeah. And it'll be against the best teams in the world. And I think if even just one good result against Portugal or Germany could show Americans that a soccer team is worth supporting. So yeah. that's my Hopefully goal. We can turn the tides here. Yeah. yeah. I've got a question for Alex, actually, just related to U.S. soccer. So okay. a lot of people, after every World Cup, it seems like, oh, you know, this World Cup, you know, a lot of people are watching. We did okay you know, this is really going to be helpful for U.S. soccer, and we're going to get better. Do you see U.S. soccer on an upward trend over these past 20, 25 years, or do you see it go up and down with the World Cup? You know, it's interesting. I It's kind of hard to see that unless you really pay attention a lot, and I, I only started paying really close attention the past couple of years, but it's been pretty actually steadily upward progression. I think the thing that pe maybe makes people think that uh, it comes and starts and stops is, you know, the World Cup. But if I think the metric I pay attention to is the number of players who play for clubs around the world. And mm -hmm. by that metric, that's gone up a lot. Um, sure. The depth of the team is really good. I saw an interesting article that showed uh, 
So that's something that's changed. In the past, we had you know maybe eight good players, and we filled it out the rest of the squad with average players. Now we have a lot of good players. And uh, someone wrote an article comparing to the players left at home. Uh, they didn't make the squad. A Landon Donovan, a Juan Agudelo, uh, even a Breck Shea. On and on. If they played, I'd I wouldn't be surprised if the team left at home could really give a game to the team that's put on the field. And so to me, that's a sign of progress. So that's part one, is we have more and more good players. Uh, one thing we're left needing to do is get the excellent players. Right? We need the game-changing players who can play for Arsenal or Manchester United. And so I think that's maybe a point of frustration, probably for a casual fan, is the fact that we haven't broken through with a superstar yet. And that's too bad, but that'll come. Um, another point of growth is MLS is growing a lot. Um, mm -hmm. The fans that you see, if you would watch a Seattle Sounders, Seattle, Portland, Timbers, Portland, yeah, yeah. If you watch those games, you're like, what country? <laughs> yeah. yeah, seriously, it's very, it's very off-putting for someone of our age range who, you know, you know, MLS used to be played in football stadiums with like 500 people watching the games. Yeah, and, you know, there's still some issues there. Um, not all the teams are on board with that, but it's moving in that direction and now you're getting situations where they can coach players from other leagues uh, starting goalkeeper for Brazil plays for Toronto it is just a part-time deal but it's kinda crazy that when Brazil trots out their starting lineup their goalie plays in MLS yeah. um, so it's little things like that um, I think this year the MLS, MLS set the record for most players on World Cup squads uh, by almost two times their previous high so um, there's a sense that MLS is really growing into, if not a great league, at least maybe a good league. And that will only help. So I think there has been growth. Good. good. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us today, Alex. Um, for those watching, Alex uh, hopefully is going to make it actually down to Brazil to uh, catch them in the <laughs> World Cup, barring uh, any visa difficulties that may or may not arise. Um, yeah. You know, if if you're able to go, we hope you are. Uh, we wish you well. I hope it's entertaining, and uh, we'll be looking uh, back for a report on that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good, guys. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. All right. Um, and for anyone watching, once again, you can get Alex at Tempo Free Soccer on Twitter, and yeah. uh, his blog where he uh, does all his amazing statistical wizardry is at uh, <laughs> TempoFreeSoccer.blogspot.com. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, guys. All right, have fun. All right, so before we before we go in and, and tackle what just happened in Game Three, oh jeez, uh, wanted to make quick mention of the Derek Fisher hire by the New York Knicks. Um, he was signed to a five-year, twenty-five million dollar deal. Uh, of course, we know Phil Jackson is at the uh, at the reins there in the Knicks organization. Um, Kurt, what's your take on that? Well, I think it's interesting that we see a trend to have more, you know, players coming right out of the league to be coaches like Jason Kidd, even like Avery Johnson of, you know, five years ago or so. Um, you know, I obviously I'm not a GM, but I feel like when you have coaches like Lionel Hollins, you know, the Van Gundys, of course, uh, Stan just got picked up. Um when you have coaches with so much experience and are battle tested, why would you take a you know take a risk, take a gamble on these uh, you know untested coaches that are are very young? Sure, there there's the upside that they're experienced. They've been in the league for a long time, especially if you're Derek Fisher. It feels like he's been in the league for about thirty thousand years, um, and even Jason Kidd, Kidd been in there forever. But still, you know. It, if if I were the GM, I would I would definitely be exploring uh, other options than than them right off the bat. Well, maybe if you were the GM of an organization other than the Knicks. Exactly, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> but this of is course, the Knicks we're talking about. But I I think you know there's some hope. You mentioned Jason Kidd, and you know he's he's been doing okay. You know, criticized early on, but turned it around, and they had a great end of the season. And so you know maybe uh maybe uh. You're more hoping for a Jeff Hornacek type of hire. Um, he started with Phoenix this year, did pretty well. I mean, oh, yeah, still, one of the coach of the year candidates. The bottom, but he's really turning things around. You know? mm -hmm. um, uh, that's a good point. I mean, and even Steve Kerr now getting picked up by uh, Golden State, I believe. You know, but of course, uh, I believe I think Jeff Hornacek and Steve Kerr had some experience, you know, behind the scenes as a 
um, not necessarily general manager, but uh, in one of those positions, yeah, executive Hornacek positions. Was, Hornacek, well, I don't know about executive. Hornacek was brought into the Jazz to be a shooting coach. Um, yeah. I think that was the only thing he was really doing before then, but um, I don't know. Uh, I I wouldn't do it myself. Um, Derek Fisher up it for Phil Jackson. Um, I feel like Phil Jackson's already playing the Knicks because he's he, you know, he's, he, he's signed to a contract basically saying, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm not going to be there half the time. Yeah. And they're still willing to give that a try just because it's Phil, you know. Because it's Phil. But, yeah, got to go with that. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with all these, these new coaches, especially, you know, with a, such a high-profile organization like the Knicks. Yeah. You're, you're in a ripe market, at least. We'll see. But, uh, okay, so let's, let's turn over this game three. We just watched the Heat um, go down at home to the Spurs Yeah. Uh, on one of the most historic first half shooting performances ever by a finals team. They shot 75.8%, the Spurs did, in the first half, uh, which is a finals record. Um, what is 90% at one point. Yeah, they, at, well, at one point, yeah, they were they were 18 for 20. Yeah, well, I think it just goes, you know, that classic saying, you can't bring a knife to a gunfight. The Spurs, they it, it turned into a shootout early on, and you know Miami was hanging with them. I think they were, at, you know, when uh, the Spurs were ninety percent uh, field goal percentage, the Miami was shooting sixty percent. I mean, if you get sixty percent out of your team every single night, you expect to win most every game. But you know, just coincided with Spurs' historic night, so it's just kind of it's it's tough, and it's a good it's a good sign for the Spurs. It's it's worth saying, you know, in the third quarter, I think the Spurs only shot what thirty five percent or so. A lot lower. Um, I think they limited to fifteen points in the third quarter. You chalk that up to more defensive action, or just more of a hey, you can't shoot ninety percent all game, or what? What is your? Take oh yeah, that? definite regression to the mean. I mean, I. I, when I was thinking of this, I thought of like a pot of boiling water. You know, it just started boiling and then started boiling over. You can't maintain that forever. And San Antonio, you know, they just kind of uh, came back down to what they what they normally shoot. So, but it still it was they were they had big enough lead and Miami found themselves in a big enough hole. Um, of course, they did come back to single digits to seven points, I believe, at the end of third or early fourth quarter. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, it seems to me that uh, what often happens with Miami, especially in the playoffs, is they kind of, I don't know if they, they're just trying to let the game come to them or if they are just they just take longer to get into rhythm, but it seems like they will give up more early. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the question is how, dig the, how big of a hole do you dig yourself before you realize you need to climb out? Yeah. And, uh, you know, on, on the hot shooting, there's not much you can do about that. Um, but I, th- I think there's a definite difference in the third quarter with the way the, the team was playing defense, at least for the first half of that quarter. Um, what I noticed, uh, Le- LeBron in the, f- the first half uh, exhibiting a lot of signs of frustration at the defensive effort of his team. Um, you know, you, you saw a lot of him pounding the basketball after you know the Spurs made a shot. Um, kind of getting in comments at, at his teammates, kind of yelling at him, getting on the cases. Um, but it seemed like he was the only one in that first half. Yeah. You mean on the defensive end or just as yeah, a whole? Yeah, defensive end. Well, you know, it's I, – I don't know. I felt like there were definite defensive lapses where, you know, Spurs got way too many easy baskets. Granted, they hit every single shot they put up. They had – their offense was perfect. They were whipping the ball around and getting lots of open looks. But at the same time, there were some defensive lapses, and you know they got a uh, you know open look two feet from the basket, and you just can't have that once, let alone half a dozen times. So I think you're right. Um, I I definitely felt like it was almost uh, wasn't even a home game for the 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 Heat. They seemed really off, especially the role players. Um, you know, if you look at the box score, I think D Wade had you know 22, and so did LeBron. So they came to play, uh, at least on the offensive end. But it seemed like uh, one of the most troubling points for Miami, it seemed like the point guard duo of Norris Cole and Mario Chalmers, who did not show up in, in the offensive end at all. 
you, you so. heard Jackson call out uh, Chalmers in the pregame. Um, he was he was saying a lot's going to depend on him, but he was expected to show up tonight. Yeah. That is definitely not what happened. Um, I, it looked like the beginning of the first quarter, it looked like the Heat were making uh, a concerted effort to get Chalmers the ball and would go in and get some shots. Um, but he missed them. He missed mm-hmm. all of them. Yeah. Kind of set the tone for him for the rest of the game. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of, uh, if you're a Heat fan, that was kind of a really frustrating thing to see when they're um, they're giving those looks to you. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, Coach Spo kind of finally gave up on him. And, you know, with, I think, seven or eight minutes left in the game, he took both of them out, you know, and rad, ran his lineup with D Wade as the main ball handler. And, you know, maybe that'll work for a little bit, but, you know, you got to find a more permanent solution. You got to get your point guards going because you can't lean so much on D Wade, on LeBron this whole time, or even Chris Bosch. You got to get everyone else going. And that's obvious. I mean, it's it seems cliche, but once you get your the rest of the team going, that's when they, you know, they really start to, to play well and become unstoppable. So, well, um, the other thing was uh, the other player a lot of attention was drawn to before this game was Kawhi Leonard. Obviously, uh, he had a rough game one and game two. Just uh, I think he was nine points in each of those games. Right. Um, kind of a non-factor. He had he ran into some foul trouble in game two. Had to sit the bench more than he's used to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, you know, obviously Pop got on him about that um, and gave him a challenge. And he took those enormous hands of his <laughs> and he answered that challenge. Uh, I, I mean, the only criticism you can have of the guys is the braids. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, hey, if you're, if you're doing this on, on this stage, I think you can do whatever you want to your hair. But I, I think this is a very good sign for the Spurs organization. They've been wanting someone who will step up and, you know, someone they can pass the baton to, and they've, they've identified Kawhi, and, you know, I don't know if he's there yet, but if he's stepping up at this level and able to, you know, uh, do what he did on both ends of the floor the entire game, you know, they, they, they were taking out Parker, they took out Parker and Duncan and kind of let him run the show along with Danny Green, who, you know, Danny Green also did an excellent job, no. overshadowed by Kawhi, but... No. Definitely out there with I think five or six steals, especially that was, they were critical. Just you know, Danny Momentum Green, so many making steals. Exactly, just punches to the Miami's gut is just yeah. tough. You know, when you do all this work and then the ball stripped away from you. So yeah, uh, but I, you mentioned Kawhi also on the defensive end. Uh, I I thought especially um, in the third quarter where it looked like maybe the Heat uh, would have gotten going a little bit more. He was really pinning LeBron down in the post and uh, forcing him to either make bad pass or uh, just kind of oh. lose the ball, get stripped when the double team came. Um, it was he. It was almost like he was in LeBron's head. Uh, he just yeah. had his number that whole that whole sequence, and I think that was what ultimately prevented Miami from making that run that we know they're capable of. They've done it mm-hmm. in the past. They showed flashes of it tonight when they, yeah. you know, they they went from. Uh, you know, 20 plus points down and being within seven in, in you know, just a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, but I think I think Leonard really was a was an X factor. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I mean, he 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 really frustrated LeBron, and I think it was mentioned uh, last game. One of the commentators mentioned that they think that the best LeBron defender is Kawhi. You know, that could be, but it's definitely. Uh, was more difficult for LeBron because it made Kawhi not only, uh, you know, made him work on the offensive end, you know, as a good defender should, but with his offensive game going on the other end, LeBron would have to expend energy on that end as well, which means a more tired LeBron, a LeBron with less energy when he has, when LeBron has a ball, has to go up against Kawhi. So it's just really frustrating for LeBron to get beat on both ends of the floor. Yeah. I think um, sometimes we see uh, LeBron almost get an easy out uh, when his jump shot is working for him, right? And it, it, he did hit a couple threes he, early on. <laughs> it looked like it was going to be one of those nights. Yeah, because he was matching Leonard in the first quarter. So exactly. The production is concerned. But um, there's a gear that, you know, 
I, I watch LeBron all the time. You watch LeBron all the time. You know that there's when he's feeling it, you can see it by the way oh, yeah. he shoots. And he didn't get to that point tonight. And that's that's really the only 100% reliable solution when he's guarded by Kawhi is when he hits that gear. <laughs> and you see him kind of taking those uh, pull-up three-pointers, kicking the front foot forward a little bit. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he just starts feeling it like that. But he, he didn't get there tonight. Um, I want to give a quick shout-out to Ray Allen uh, because even though, you know, he, he didn't add a whole lot tonight, um, I've just noticed over these playoffs how it seems like he is – turning back the hands of time. Oh, and, as uh, evidenced in game yeah. one with yeah, his dunk. That's got to be one of – that's got to be one of the biggest highlights of this final so far. No one was expecting. You know, yeah. Ray Allen, just like tonight, he got out on the fast break and Kawhi altered his shot and he, he threw up some ridiculous, you know, layup off the glass and hit nothing else. That's what we were expecting in game one when he was on that breakaway. But sure, like – came out of nowhere and didn't just junk it. He threw it down. Yeah. And sorry, sorry for sorry for, you know, backtracking a little bit, but I just was I jumped out of my seat at that point. That was wonderful. Yeah. And he he's just showing a, a new uh, level of athleticism and I, he must be on the deer antler spray or something. <laughs> he must have some some funky thing from China going down. I know, he's there's he's, no other answer to me. I mean, he's 38 going on 53. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. He just keeps doing it week after – I mean, excuse me, season after season. So uh, and hopefully he keeps going. As a Heat fan, you love to see it. Um, also another person you got to mention has been Rashard Lewis. You know, yeah. I, I heard in this game five playoff games in a row he's in double-digit points. And those double-digit points come from his corner threes for the most part. He had a couple layups. But that really stretches the floor. That alters the Spurs' game plan entirely. You know, if you notice, the splitter didn't start this game. They had Diaw out there. You know, someone that could could chase him off the line. But sure enough, Rashard, you know, still hitting those threes. And this is after he's played. He played very little in uh, the regular season. And to expect someone to come in, you know, the Eastern Conference Finals against the Pacers and start after not doing much. You know, it's it's a lot to it's a it's a lot of pressure to put on someone to you know click with the offense and everything. And um, Coach Spo tried that with Michael Beasley in the Eastern in the the series against the finals or against the Pacers, excuse me, and that didn't work out. And you know, and it's not I don't think it's a fault of Michael Beasley because, like I said, you know, he it's tough just you know jumping in and trying to play with this team. Um, you know, yeah, without you James Jones doing the same thing too. Exactly, that's another right. perfect example. And sometimes, you know, it, it'll seem like he's coming off the bench, like ready to go. And sometimes, like tonight, uh, he just oh, doesn't horrible impacting. It was like I, he played a handful of minutes and had a handful of fouls. It was just <laughs> tough. I mean, and yeah, I think that too. that's that's too. probably Heat's problem. They just need to get you know more people involved. Like I said, I feel like the point guards weren't there. Ray Allen didn't have a lot, very productive offensive night. Um, James Jones didn't do anything. Birdman didn't do much on the offensive end. Granted, I think they did o- – well, let me say this. I think they, they did okay defensively, and Spurs were hitting their shots. So, I mean, you can't expect to yeah. – you know. But I, the thing is, you did not see uh, Ray or Richard flying around screens with that open look for the three. And – uh, that you gotta credit that to the Spurs. They oh yeah. They wouldn't let him get open. And that's true. Th- when you you know we got to that point where it was, you know, six seven minutes left in the fourth, and you know the Heat are down fifteen, and you know you got to get the shooters going to stay in the game, um, and the Spurs just prevented them from even having a chance. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's that's you know all credit to the Spurs. All them. credit to the Spurs. I know we're both you know Heat fans and. LeBron supporters, but Spurs top down, best organization hands down um, in the NBA right now, uh, and for a long time. And it doesn't matter who they put in, they're getting production. They're you know maybe not you know showing up in the stat sheet, but they're they're making an impact. They're having an impact. They're uh, the only player that well, 
there's a caveat to that. The only person that I feel like Pop should leave on the bench is Matt Bonner. You know, I think you put him in there to kind of stretch the floor and get Richard out of the, the paint area. But at the same time, he's not even getting any open looks. I, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, use him. On the other hand, uh, Patty Mills is like the 2011 J.J. Barea of the Dallas Mavericks. You know, not afraid to take big shots or make big plays on this stage despite being, you know, relatively no-namer up until this season. So, but yes, all credit to San Antonio and, and their organization and their team. Yeah. I, I, I want to talk about one more thing, um, just for the series in general. Um, I've heard a little bit of conversation about this, but uh, the home court advantage, we're talking about uh, two very different home courts, right? You've got the Spurs, who, you know, even when they're behind, every basket made seems to energize the crowd, get them going, um, and in when you're watching the game and your team is playing the Spurs and the Spurs are behind but they hit a shot, it feels like you're losing. Uh, and then you turn around you have the Heat. On the other hand, the crowd, especially tonight, I, I felt like was just not helping them out. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I think most people would agree with that assessment of the two home crowds, but the question is, does home court advantage matter to these two teams? Oh, man. <laughs> uh... I think the Spurs are to the point where they're so disciplined that you know either place is the same to them. You know, in that regard, it's it's very little difference for them, which is evidenced by you know I think at the end of the game, one of the commentators mentioned that this is their 38th road win of the season, playoffs included, which is you know no small feat. You know, especially if you. Um, in the in the first home game that the Heat have dropped in the playoffs. Exactly. Um, the Heat went up plenty on the road as well. I think um, maybe there's no difference for Miami, but at the same time, maybe there should be a difference for Miami. Uh, you know, whereas you know the Heat should be getting a little bit more boost from your from the crowd, like you're saying, when they don't get it. So playing at home or playing away doesn't really make a difference for them. Yeah, I mean, you see the Heat crowd walking out with three and a half minutes yep. left in the game. Yeah. yeah, you're down 15, and yeah, it's kind of unlikely that you're going to be there, but this is the very same crowd that learned that lesson last year. Oh, yeah, game and, six. And let's not forget, you're at the NBA Finals anyway. Yeah. Why, why would you want to leave? Oh, yeah, man, I just really want to get out of here 15 minutes sooner. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was NBA Finals. Yeah, exactly. That was my. That's the biggest thing to me. If I if I'm at an NBA Finals game, there's no way you're gonna pry me from the seat. I don't I'm care. You know. In that seat for two more hours after it <laughs> yeah. finishes. I'm gonna bring. I'm gonna hook myself up to a catheter or something so I don't miss anything. I'm staying in my seat the whole time. You can't miss anything. I mean, it's the playoffs, finals. But I, you know, and and think about what that's like as a player. So say you you know you're you're LeBron or or Wade taking the ball down court, uh, you got three and a half minutes left and you're you're you can see the people leaving. As oh player, yeah. You can see the people leaving. And that's true. The effect that that's got to have on you when when you know that it's crunch time and that if you need to make a move and the time is now. You yeah, know, your fans are abandoning you essentially. Your fans, and and I mean that is. Uh, just just plays right into the game of everyone who loves to hate on the Heat as a team, as an organization. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just the worst possible situation. Yeah, they're not doing themselves any favors at all. Yeah, I don't understand why the Heat crowd doesn't take a page out of someone else's book yeah. or their, even their own book, lessons <laughs> that they've learned. Yep. Get it together and like help the guys out. Yeah. You know? So what's what's the next step? What what does this mean for for Game Four and the rest of the series? Uh, well, I don't think we can count on ninety percent shooting. Right. In Spurs in Game Four. Um, that I mean that that is another thing to consider. Uh, it all like even even when you take into account what happened, it wasn't an absolute beatdown by yeah. the Spurs, right? So you know, say say they shot sixty seventy percent instead of ninety percent for yeah. that streak, you know, you could be talking about a very different result. 
and um, and you know the Heat possibly up two to one. And I know you you can't keep going back and talk about the what ifs and the maybe mm -hmm. and the missed opportunities and stuff like that. But I mean, you've got you've got cramps in game one where Miami are in control of the game. Of yeah, the, momentum in their favor. The so yeah. they they so the Spurs could have possibly been down three to zero right now. Yeah. Um, so I well, feel yeah. A little fortunate. No, I think you got to give them game three. I mean, I think game two was Miami. I think game three tonight was San Antonio. But game one was a toss-up. That was the only one where I feel like if LeBron didn't cramp up, if he didn't go out, you know, it would have been a different story. So. Well, I, I guess my point is I can't imagine the elements coming together in a similar way again. And Plans were aligned, man. Yeah, I, I can't imagine Miami dropping a, two, two home games in a row. In the finals, I think you're right. I just, I just can't imagine it. So, I, I count on uh, Miami to come back in a big way. I count on the same production you can always count on LeBron for, you know, 27 points. Uh, Wade will have to keep himself in the game. Um, Chalmers think, will have to show up. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think Wade has been doing great this all, you know, the entire playoffs. You know, he's been getting his 20 points. He's accepted his role as, you know, second banana and been, you know, doing what he needs to do. Yeah. Getting to the line, um, making he's plays in the paint. He's been lethargic, though, from time well, to time. And he's been better about that this year than in past years. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, I just, so that's what I'm saying. You know, just as long as he could stay on top of it, um, I expect Chalmers to have a better game. I expect the shooters to find a way to get open. Um, I, I just see Miami taking game four. Yeah. So do you think, just a quick question following up with that, do you think that the shooters getting open, do you think um, the reason why they haven't been is through effort of the Spurs or, you know, just the offensive coaching by Spo hasn't been up to snuff or, you know, defensive coaching by, you know, Pop has been better? I, I think it's Pop. Uh, yeah, Bo is a great coach. He's he's one of the great coaches in the NBA right now. And right now, a young guy. Mm -hmm. you know, he's he knows what he's doing. I don't know if you you um, saw his uh, his after I think it was after quarter two, it might have been quarter three interview with uh, Doris Burke. Doris, yeah, and after he, three. He always has the right answer in those situations, and you know, I I Pop is amazing. And the Spurs are, like you said, a disciplined, motivated team. So I, I chalk that up to the Spurs. And uh, as a result of that, I expect Spo to take them and, and find a way to get them open. Mm -hmm. He's not the kind of coach that's going to sit on, you know, the, the game tape and be like, oh, maybe next time yeah. we'll go better. You know, he knows, what, he knows what's at stake, and uh, I expect a change. So. Okay, well... Uh, I guess that'll probably wrap it for tonight. Um, we'll be back, I'm sure. We don't know when. It'll be occasional. <laughs> It'll be occasionally insightful, maybe, we hope. Um, but we'll have plenty to talk about, I'm sure. I think this this series is maybe going seven, right? I think it's going to go seven. Might go seven. Probably will go seven. We'll, we'll go seven. seven. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, thanks everyone who to our uh, our small faithful group of, of people who tuned in for at least some amount of time tonight to uh, to uh, you know have a conversation with us. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get some more involvement from you guys in the future, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.